Hello, welcome to the rentrée of Café Rollist. Uh, we are back after a hiatus, hiatus, or you say that in English. Well, we're back, and we're back in yes. good company. Thanks for uh, helping me with my English, Will. Uh, Will, could you introduce yourself? Yeah. I am Will Munn. I am the lead designer and publisher of Arium by Adapticurus, which is on Kickstarter right now. Um, I've been in the RPG industry as a freelancer for a few years. Uh, I've worked on some projects like the Zorro role-playing game, uh, Cold Shadows, and um, Tiny Frontiers Revised. Cool. Well, I haven't played uh, Zorro, the role-playing game yet, but uh, uh, it was brought to my attention because I'm a big fan of the D6 system from the old Star Wars. So when I heard they were making a new game using that uh, that structure, uh, I thought it was a uh, very good news. And I think we we played together at the Gauntlet, but I'm not quite sure which game it was anymore. Uh, was it? Midnight checkpoint midnight maybe no it was checkpoint midnight yeah. yes cool well we got a YouTube video of that people can check it out I need uh, as I was saying it's the rentrée I'm back from uh, a long time abroad uh, visiting family which is uh, it's great being in wonderful places but uh, being with the family is a bit stressful I need to go check the gauntlet calendar to go back sign up to loads of games uh, there. You've been with the Gauntlet for a long time, uh, Will? Uh, I have been a member for, I think, probably a year and a half now, something like that. I haven't played a ton of games on it, but I'm really, I was really impressed with the with the game that Alan put on for us specifically. I, I enjoyed it a lot. Alan is it's a very good uh, game master. I played with him a, a couple sure of times. Is. And it's been uh, always a pleasure. It seems we have our first bot in the chat room since the, the launch of the show, so I guess we can celebrate. So it's asking us if we want to become famous and buy followers. We won't be doing that uh, because that would be cheating, and we're not cheaters. And we don't we don't fudge our dice and stuff like that. Um, so the, this game started during what soon here in London is going to be known as the first lockdown because we're about to enter the second. And we have two ice-breaking questions in relation to that lockdown. The first one is, uh, what's your routine like at the moment, uh, Will? Mm. Uh, it is, it's very uh, stay-at-home related. So I, you know, I get up, do my normal, you know, eat some breakfast. And I come and usually log into my my office computer, right? Because I have an office computer at home, so I'll log into that and do some work for probably, like I'm not an early riser per se, right? So I, I get up and I go to work pretty much, right? Uh, and, and then I'll, you know, sometime around five, uh, I'll finish for the day, uh, take a, take a little break, and then I go back to work because, you know, I'm a, RPG writer, and that's kind of when you do your job. If you're if you have another job during the day as well, so so that's yeah, that's how I spend most of my time. So when you say you get up, writing. you get up to work. You you work for Adep Icarus because we had a lot of people who are uh, not uh, cursed or blessed uh, to be full time game designers. So you work for for yeah. Adept Icarus then? I don't. I am not full time. Uh, so I do I do work for Adapticurus, but only in only in the evenings. Um, and so in the daytime, I work for a company called Health Equity, which is a health savings account company here in the states. Okay, great. And uh, as part of the well, have you recently picked up any new hobby, skill, or interest in relation to the fact that we are stuck home a bit lately? Hmm. Um. So I have a daughter who's learning to drive. Wow. Uh, and I've been going for drives with her a lot. 
and we live in an area that's kind of pretty. And so we've actually taken some some interesting drives out through the mountains or, you know, to see different parts of the city that maybe she hasn't really driven in to just give her the experience, whatever it is that she can see. Although we don't, you know, go into a lot of places because things being what they are, right? Uh, we, you know, tend to keep to ourselves as much as possible, but drives have been fun. So there's been no sort of, I know what you did last summer type of situation you need to to testify about at the moment. No, nothing yet. <laughs> so uh, the big news is that you've got five, five and a half days left for your big Kickstarter for Harem RPG, about which I, I know nothing because I, I'm keeping myself away from Kickstarter because otherwise I... I mean, I'm unemployed, I don't have a pay at the moment, so I really need to be strict with myself. But uh, yeah, tell me, uh, curse me with the knowledge of what I'm missing with Harium. <laughs> so Arium is a, it's a combination of a world building toolkit and a role playing game. Um, the, the secret uh, sort of behind it is that it's it's a very it probably i mean you look at our role-playing games and you say well this is an activity that is very collaborative right it's something that people do together and they create a story together um but what isn't always as collaborative uh even that even i've seen this in in uh, other games that are based and that have kind of their roots in world building um is that that part of it often involves one person telling one part of what the world building looks like and another person telling another part and they kind of continue on their separate paths or maybe someone will build off of something that that someone else has made but the the onus for that creation resides with whoever has the talking stick right or whoever has has the the control at the moment um and arium is is different in that it is a very truly collaborative and um, and uh, thought sharing. I don't know. I'm looking for a better word, but uh, it's a game where everyone really has an equal share of that burden of creating the world together. Um, and we do that through some mechanics that are that are different from anything that that's really in the market. I know I've heard people say that before, but it is, it is different um, in that, you know, everyone is spending some time generating ideas. They do it by themselves in isolation, in quiet, right? And they're generating small ideas. They put them together. And then once, once those ideas have been generated and we usually set a timer and, and it goes pretty quickly, then everyone talks through all of them and they agree on uh, combining ideas that are the same, of course, uh, and also on combining ideas that would be better together than they are apart. Um, and then once the group goes through that exercise, which is the larger part of, of, the, of a step in the world building process, then they vote. Um, and they vote on, they get a, cert a set number of votes and the ideas that have the top amount of votes become canon for the world that they were created. Um, and then you move on to another step, which drills down into more details of the world based on what they've already decided. So is there a sort of a, a framework in terms of uh, trope or genre, or, or is it a, a system, uh, a game you can use for a noir setting, for a cyberpunk setting, for a Star Wars setting, for fan high fantasy setting. Can you use it for anything, or is it is it uh, framed into a sp specific thing? Uh, it isn't framed into a set genre. In fact, that is the that's the second question we asked during the world building. Is you know what are the universal concepts of this of this world that we want to game in together? Is it you know, you can use genre as a as a uh, a concept here. You can use theme. Uh, you can use um, tone, right? 
those are the types of things we talk about in the universal step of creating a new world with Arium. So why did you come up? What, first of all, what, what does Arium mean? Uh, uh, I'm always interested in titles of games. Uh, what's the, what's it called? Uh, etymology of that word. Yeah, Arium is a Latin root. Uh, it is the Latin root for a container of something. Uh, and it's, it's a funny story uh, because when we, when we were looking at trying to decide names for the game, this game has had three or four names, something like that. Um, our first, our first name was, uh, gosh, lean world building or something ridiculous like that, that no one would care about. Uh, and then later on, we called it for a little while, the sticky note RPG, which was equally uninspiring. Uh, and so, you know, we sat down and we applied actually the game's process to come up with a name for the game. Uh, and we generated a bunch of ideas and then we, you know, we talked about them and collaborated and then we ended up voting and, and came up with uh, a name that didn't actually show up even in our ideas. But uh, we had at least one or two ideas that came from a couple of the core collaborators for the for creation of Arium. Um, as uh, I can't remember what one of them was like possible arium or something of you know it was something very wordy and very and very long and you know we didn't love that but as we looked at it we thought well you know what if we use something else with the suffix arium and so we started looking at other ideas and then we said well what if we got rid of the prefix <laughs> and just left arium as a as a latin root of a container for possibility that's what we were hoping to evoke yeah, it's funny. I never realized that Arium was yeah the end of uh, uh, Imaginarium or I mean there, there's so many uh, yet at the same time I cannot remember any uh, Vivarium uh, anything like that. So yeah, you you can have Cyber Arium or Star Wars Arium or whatever Arium you you wish right. to do. So uh, wh wh where did the the desire to create that? Uh, that system uh, c come from? Is it something you thought what was missing when you were preparing campaigns or, yeah? I mean, a little bit, that's, that's part of it, sure. But, um, but the real, like where it came from, we were, it was myself and Drew Gherkin, who's one of the other core writers, we were in a writing group together, uh, a fiction writing group, right? Although, you know, I was writing RPG uh, content as a freelancer at the time. Um, and we, we developed the exercise of lean world building as we were calling it at the time, right. Uh, as part of, uh, our, a meeting of this writer's group. So we were just meeting together with some folks and we said, Hey, we're going to, we're going to come to the group tonight and we will bring this idea that we made about, you know, how to, how to create a, a world together to write in. And that was the, that was the goal, right? We thought, okay, we'll create this world. And then anybody, you can write a short story in this world or, or whatever you want. And so we did that and the group really enjoyed it. And so we took the show on the road and we went to a couple of writing conventions and we thought we'll share this with more writers and see if they like it. And they did turns out right everyone seemed to really enjoy it we did it we've done it for groups as large as maybe 20 or so in front of a like an audience basically and wow. have them all participating um and so um in those you know i i can't remember i think we were at firecon um it was maybe two two years and a few months ago something something in that neighborhood um, and I was there um, working at the Gallant Night Games booth that they had there. So it was a combination gaming, writing, um, and, and several other things. Basically anything, you know, kind of associated with speculative fiction or genre, right? Um, and, and we presented it there. And afterward, I just couldn't get the idea out of my head that maybe this is more fun as a game than it is as a writing tool right <laughs> uh 
and you know, I kind of noodled on that for a while, and um, I eventually uh, came back to Drew and I said, "Hey, what if we, what if we um, figured out how to make this work for role playing?" And he's a role player as well, and, and has been for ages, right? And so we talked about that a little bit. And someone who was there um, at that at that uh, convention that we talked to about it quite a bit was uh, Natasha Enns who um, wrote the core of the rules for Discover, which is our role-playing rules. Um, and she had a, you know, a um, oof, genreless approach, I guess, uh, to role-playing rules that she'd been working on for a while. And it, it was, uh, it was kismet. It was, it was meant to be. So, yeah. So the, the people you first used this tool with were were not actually tabletop RPG fans. They they were they were writers, novelists, script writers, and so on. Yeah. So that's yeah. interesting because I was wondering, as we see, you know, uh, while we played together at the Gauntlet, and I think we we s we discussed that a tiny bit when we played uh, with Alan, uh, the fact that. Uh, that's fascinating at the moment how broad the spectrum of what role-playing games are uh, is on offer. And I find we, we often discuss rules heavy versus, versus light on rules. And we don't often discuss what, what's, for lack of a better explanation, I find is first-person role-playing versus third-person role-playing, which is more another way to describe it for me. Third-person would be... First-person would be like you're, you're like the actor and you try to interpret the character and uh, live up the emotions of the character like third person it's it's more like the writers and often it's a it's a collective thing it's a writers room exercise but as there are so many excellent uh like pbta many of them are pbta games in which you are you're in this let's write a story together i, I always wonder how much novelists, script writers might or might not be using things like that to come up with ideas and fluff out uh, yeah, plays, scripts uh, and novels. Uh, so uh, is this something which, which is happening? Is uh, what became I am one of those and there are several going on or is this something people were in, would be interested to purchase I am to, to do that with? Um... It definitely can be, and we do know of a couple of groups um, of folks who are among early playtesters that uh, are using the concepts of RM2 um, to, you know, write stories together with a writing group, right? And so uh, there's one there's one group in particular, and maybe two. I think I heard of a second um, that are. <clears throat> They built a world together using Arium, and then they are planning to write an anthology based on the world that they created together. Wow, cool! And so, just a just a series of short stories and publish it. Yeah, so I thought that was very cool. Yeah, yeah, it's it's quite fascinating. Uh, recently, uh, I watched a video by Lindsay Hellis, who is a uh, a novelist, no, a New York bestseller novelist with a, a brand new book, at Axiom's End. And she made a video about Tolkien and uh, she was explaining how Tolkien developed the world of Middle Earth as part of his hobby of making up languages and coming up with a backstory for the languages. And so it was fascinating how, yeah, we know the story of the Lord of the Ring, we know, we know the novels, but there's so much law behind it and the books themselves are that much richer because someone was sort of role playing on his own and developing his world and having a kick doing that and it was his hobby and it was something personal not even something he meant to share with the the wide world uh that he developed all this stuff and then and then you got a a work a piece of art which which influences uh everyone everyone behind it but yeah it's it starts with a with a game you play. Yeah. So you are five days away from uh, the end of this Kickstarter. Uh, I guess you, you've been on a lot of interviews to promote this Kickstarter. You, we are towards the end. Uh, 
Are there stuff you you wish you could tell yourself at the beginning of the campaign uh, that you have learned now that you have done a bit differently? Uh, yeah, that's a that's a fantastic question. I, it's a classic. To uh, be fair, I've heard yeah, it yeah, in many yeah. places. <laughs> no, it's it's very good. I think. Uh, whew, yeah, I'd have to have time to stop and think in order to come up with those things. Um, no, I. <laughs> I think that there's, you know, there's one thing in particular, right? Um, I, I think you can't, you can't discount the value of your lead up to the Kickstarter, right? The preparation, the, the, you know, starting to spread the word before the Kickstarter launches. I think that is, that is incredibly valuable. Um, however, there's a lot more to it than that, um, but. But the one thing that really, I mean, the first few days, I would say maybe the first five or six days of this campaign were very, you know, heavy, a lot of, a lot of action. And uh, I, I think I probably would have taken a little bit more time to breathe uh, during those days if looking back on it now, or maybe I wouldn't, who knows, maybe when I launch another Kickstarter, uh, I'll do the same thing again, right? But but it feels like there wasn't, you know, there wasn't much room for self-care during those days. And I think I might've changed that a little bit. Um, but, but as far as the success of the campaign goes, I think that that work in advance, you can't discount it, right? I see people drop onto Kickstarter. I, I watch every tabletop RPG Kickstarter that comes through because, because I'm an addict and I love tabletop RPGs and I love Kickstarter and so I back a lot of them but um, but the ones that that do well you can tell that they have spent you know more than five hours <laughs> preparing their Kickstarter in advance right sometimes yeah. you'll see some drop and they they don't have much in the way of art design and it's you know just a, a few paragraphs and and that isn't that's definitely the opposite of the way to launch a successful Kickstarter. Actually, that's a good point uh, because yeah, I mentioned uh, Paris Gondo, the, the game I'm developing, and uh, you know I have a, a good friend now, Federico Sons. He developed and uh, successfully funded uh, Nibiru on uh, on Kickstarter, and uh, and I, I was trying to to draw a comparison and, and trying to work out some things for myself, but. Nibiru has got a setting which, with a, a clear identity, a clear visual identity. He commissioned a lot of gorgeous art. Uh, it's got the pitch of the, the setting and so on. And yeah, for my own game, which has got kind of a concept, it's about... Uh, uh, yeah, the, the, the rules of encumbrance in dungeon crawling through the lens of well-being advice uh, like Marie Kondo and this sort of, of thing. Uh, but I was wondering, okay, I got some art, I'm considering to purchase, it's a bit comedic, so I, I can find something uh, right with the tone, but yeah, unlike something like Nibiru, I don't have a setting that I can tell that much about, I don't, I don't have, I got a system mainly and a, and a concept, but I don't have this two or three supplements that I say, oh, we'll, we'll sell you the, the supplements about that, that little village over there. And if we unlock that big goal, we'll have a big city or then we'll have the, the beach and then you'll have the supplements with the pirates and so on. Uh, how did you manage that? What, what sort of art did you include in Iron, which is a settingless, develop your own universe thing? And uh, yeah, what, what, what do you sell when you don't have a, a setting to sell? Uh, <laughs> not, not that there's no value uh, in no, no, uh, quotation mark just a setting, no, but I, I do know that that's what attracts people. Like, like you mentioned, the art right. it's very important for a Kickstarter. That's really what it's the hook for people. So yeah, uh, I haven't, I haven't yeah, had. You're absolutely right. I didn't even watch I Am yet, to be honest. <laughs> so, which is, uh, I'm sorry about that. So I'm very curious, actually, what what I'm about to see when I'm gonna check it out. Yeah, I think um, that was one of the most difficult challenges for me personally, because I'm the art director 
uh, for the for the project, right? And it was my first time taking on that responsibility. Um, we looked at a lot of different art early on, just looking for something, anything that would would work. We we thought of different concepts um, of, you know, how do you how do you display possibility, right? And so the the simplest answer possible is to take an approach similar to microscope and do a black cover with a logo and call it good because that is you know you're leaving it open for interpretation right? this is whatever, more whatever yeah exactly less is more whatever someone comes up with then they can fill that in with their own imagination but it it fell a little flat uh for us um, and we wanted to continue looking and that's honestly why it took us it's a good chunk of the reason why it took so long to get this game to Kickstarter right was because we wanted to have the right art in place um, and so and the cover was key right so the cover man, we searched searched and searched and searched for an artist for the cover um, and eventually I came across uh, Andreas Rocha, and I'm probably butchering how you pronounce his name, um, from Portugal, uh, who did the cover art. Uh, you can find him on ArtStation. He is fantastic, fantastic, um, like landscape, uh, you know, sort of unique world type of artist. Um, and he just had so many examples of different things on his in his portfolio that that all felt like they could fit what our vision for Arium was. And and so the approach that we took instead of saying, well, we're going to go with something as blank as possible. Instead, we tried to get something that was a little more broad. Right. And so a large landscape um, and to and, and we actually took inspiration from several of the Arium play tests that we did in order to create the, to give the guidance for the artist, right, on what should be in it. So it's um, original so art, it's not existing it's, it's pieces. Art. Yeah, yeah. So we commissioned that original art for, and we actually commissioned three covers, but they're triptych. So they, they you know, continue on into each other. And so you've only seen the two covers. If you've looked at the Kickstarter at this point, there are two covers on the Kickstarter. We have art for a third cover as well, um, which we'll, we'll reveal if we start to get close to the stretch goal that'll let us publish that third book and give the PDF free to everybody. Um, but it's, it's yeah, it's close. So, so that art, yeah, it was entirely designed based on you know, first and foremost, the talent of of Andreas, who's wonderful, wonderful artist, um, but but also with some some thoughts from Ariums that we created during playtesting. It's really fascinating that we live in a day and age when we have access to one another. You know, artists and developers, and we have platforms like ArtStation or the many hashtags. If you check. I recommend people check invisible hashtag invisible women or uh, yeah there, there's plenty and it's kind of seasonal they they come back on Twitter or on Instagram there's so many yeah beautiful artists out there and and you can access to them you can reach them out and say well I've got this project and I've got this budget that you can those two meet together and when you're lucky it's possible so so it's truly uh, uh, amazing. Uh, I, I love the colors uh, of uh, Arium. It's uh, it's a bit reminiscent of uh, a lot of movie and video game posters. Those two contrasting colors meeting one another, but uh, it's it sort of brings things together uh, very well. Um, did you? I recently participated a a panel for Albacan, uh, which should be available sem September twenty third for people watching this on the Albacan uh, YouTube channel. Uh, and we discussed things which happened in 2020 and one of the things which were brought up was that games now, s several of them, maybe a growing number of them, 
uh, develops digital tools for people to, to play them, to use them uh, online, and it can be as simple as a Excel spreadsheet or a PDF or something more complicated, mm. uh, more extensive like uh, I believe uh, Alice is missing. Uh, Burn Bright also was mentioned uh, in that vein. Uh, is there anything like that as part of Arium? Is it something you, you considered or were you kind of caught off foot by by the lockdown and so on? Mm -hmm. Because things change yeah. over the last few months. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the same yeah, world anymore. No, that's true. It's very true. Uh, luckily, we had already put some thought into how you could play games online uh, or streamed or however you wanted to uh, in advance of, of the lockdown um, because I think that trend has been happening for a while. It's just that it has been accelerated now a lot um, by, by the state of the world. And so, yeah, um, we did put thought into that. There's some guidance in, in the books, right? Um, that have, have been there from, from the beginning, basically, right? Um, in order to do that, we did play testing with online games with, you know, people in, in all different locations early on. Um, and so, so yeah, we do have, have some guidance on that. And, and I think, um, well, so there's one bit. So we've got, we direct people to a site that we really like for creating the world. And then as far as characters go and, and things like that, then, um, you know, a Google sheet or whatever works great. Uh, we have one that we used in play testing and we actually have a social stretch goal, I think, to clean it up a little bit and just give it to everybody so that they can use it if they want to. Um, it's, it's not, you know, um, it's not going to be fancy or anything, but it'll be something you can use. And, and of course, anybody can change it and do whatever they want with it. It's just a, it's just a free Google sheet. So do, do what you like. Well, it's practical. Uh, did you made a lot of, well, I assume you have, uh, did, did the project change a lot uh, across the the playtest and the demonstration? Did, did, was it part of the foundation worked ahead of the campaign to run a, a lot of sessions of the game uh, online and at conventions? Absolutely. Yeah, we ran uh, at quite a few different conventions, um, some local conventions here to where I live in, in uh, near Salt Lake City in Utah. Um, but also uh, at conventions, we ran at, you know, PAX Unplugged in Philadelphia. We run at some some other places as well. And and uh, early on, we're doing that. And then we also um, uh, ran some online uh, play tests with folks that we had met at different conventions. Uh, so we brought together some of those folks from conventions and a few of their friends and did some did online play testing that way um, fairly early. Um, and yeah, I think there's a there's a ton of value in doing play testing. I, th I think um, in order to to really see how your game actually works, you have to play it right, and you have to play it with new people. So if you play it with, you know, say you've got three creators, right, or, or whatever, or you've got you as the creator and your normal game group that you always play with, well, they already know your idiosyncrasies as a GM or your idiosyncrasies of how you think about games. And so there are things, there are assumptions they're going to make uh, and that you'll make with them that won't make their way into... Um, well, that will make their way into the game. And and then when other people pick it up, they'll say, well, wait, what, what were you thinking here? What's, I don't understand, right? Or, or hey, how come you didn't think about this? And it's, it's, you know, it's great that we have those connections with people, right? And that we know each other so well, but, but if you're going to create something for broad distribution, then you have to have other people look at it. Well, it's quite fascinating how much there's... Uh... No, I'm not sure if subtext is the right word, but uh, yeah, there's things you you don't really realize. You play with some people, even not people you you play that much, but because you you part of the the same circle online, 
there are, there are references which are shared, assumptions which are made, and then you play with somebody else and they, they assume something entirely different. And you're like, oh, wait, I need to clarify that, or I didn't think of that at all. Uh, I told it, yeah, I, I'm running quite a, a bit of them at the moment. Uh, I've been running like 22 sessions now uh, of the game I'm, I'm developing. And uh, yeah, at, at first I had a bit cold feet regarding doing playtests. I read some blog posts about how to do them, and it felt really like you you'd run a playtest but you have a survey questionnaire after it and people would answer it and at the end i didn't do any of this i just ran the game which is a uh it's a small format game you know it's not it's, it's not as ambitious as uh, you, you games with full-fledged system to to encounter a number of circumstances but yeah you just run it and you see what happens and you, you learn so much and I, what i found out is that usually the Sessions go two ways. Uh, I get it's a spectrum in between, but either things go very well, but I don't learn anything very useful for the game, but it gives me energy to continue because people show enthusiasm regarding the project. And at the other end of the spectrum, sessions don't go very well, but that's a session where I learn, oh, I can perfect this bit or this bit, I can write a script or something. So to frame things a bit better, make the game a bit clearer to people. Uh, that's, so if, if it doesn't go as well, that's where I learn more. If it goes very well, I don't learn much, but that's really what I need to go on <laughs> with the project because now, now I got people saying, yeah, we like that. We'd like, we'd like more of that. Yeah, I mean, the, the positive feedback can be good, um, but it's always, it's always helpful to get something that says, you know, here's, here's something that I didn't like. And so when I, yeah, I've read a bunch of those same things about how to do play testing and I've been part of play testing groups for other game companies. Right. And so I, I've seen a lot of different options there, but I think you're absolutely right. You can get a lot of it as a designer, as a, as a writer by, you know, observing, by listening. Right. Um, but I usually ask two questions at the end of any play test and I just ask, what was your favorite thing and what was your least favorite thing, right? And, and you know, sometimes people have good, succinct answers to that question and sometimes they don't. Um, but, but usually if you give them the option to give both, then they don't feel so bad about giving the what didn't you like feedback, right? Nice that's shit the, sandwich. the value is. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes. Well, I guess if you just have one, it's more a smorgasbord uh, of shit rather than a sandwich, but... Uh... Yes. <laughs> that, um, uh, what was I about to say? Um, yeah, I need to get back uh, at those interviews. Uh, at some point, I was I was a bit tired of them, and now I need to get back on, on the bicycle. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, sort of a step I'm, I'm at at the moment. Um, so I'm writing my, my text, my rules, and uh, trying to find ways to, to convey this idea to people because the next step for me is to have something written, hand it to someone who never played the game, and see if they can work work out what the hell I is going on. So how oh, was that, that step for you of uh, yeah stepping away, just using the text as this interface with whoever would use it and uh, and then find out how a playtest goes yeah uh humbling i guess <laughs> <laughs> i think is a good is a good way to put it um because yeah it's definitely difficult to to see folks struggle with you know what you've what you've created and and uh and that's definitely i think the you know, when you can't be there to just explain it to them, right? Um, that's when the, the most opportunity for for that kind of interaction comes up. And then you have to figure out, well, how do we explain this? How, how do we, you know, turn it into something that someone can follow? Um, and and you, you hate to, you know, resort to rote, um, examples but uh, at some point right that is the right thing to help certain certain players right 
And so, you know, we ended up writing some of those for folks as well, in addition to clarifying some rules and, and things like that. But, but for, you know, the other thing that you can do, and, and we've done this quite a bit uh, in the last few months is, is just run, you know, online streamed games, right? So people can get sort of the sense of how things flow. Um, and, and that, that can be good for certain groups as well. I mean, not everybody watches streamed games, obviously. Not everybody wants to read examples in a book, right? But uh, it's just providing options, I think, because that's the, that's the key of it is not everyone learns the same way. And so just provide options for folks and that, that helps. Yeah, what I'm trying to do for mine is I'm adopting a sort of format, which apparently is a, the common format for role-playing games uh, in uh, in Japan, which is to enclose a, a replay, which is a like a actual play stream or podcast, but in written form. So uh, it's a transcript of a of a session. So at the moment, I'm retyping yeah. a, a session we played, and uh, I'm uh, I'm hurting as I'm retyping it because I know I I'm gonna have to pull away one of the characters, one of the players, because the whole thing doesn't doesn't fit. Uh, but uh, it's yeah, it's um, it's interesting. Um, so you mentioned there's a third book coming, hopefully as part of the goals. What what is this third book in the campaign, and what should people rush to uh, to pledge and make it happen? So the third book is called Arium Evolve, and it provides uh, rules and and um, oh, mainly rules and, and examples on how to evolve and, and continue to develop the world that you've created uh, as a series of downtime exercises in between uh, role-playing sessions. Okay. And so, yeah, it, it really sort of brings out the, you know, no matter how rich and interesting a world is that you create in two hours, um, at, a, at some point you're going to exhaust, you know, the what's part of that. And what we don't want folks to do is go back to the, you know, well, okay, let's put the onus back on the game master, right? And say, okay, you go and create more fun for us to have, right? Instead, we want the group to help create that together. Uh, and, you know, create new interesting locations, add more people to the world, more, uh, more, you know, organizations or new cultures, uh, and, and just continue to add those things as time goes by. So Arium works in combination. Could or is it from the get-go supposed to work in combination with another game? Or do you have games to resolve, uh, let's say, the or do you call that, you know, the, the action of, a, of an encounter, of, a, of an, uh, an adventure, or is it like from what I heard Microscope that you you create your world and then you pick up maybe another system you are fond of, you play in that world, and then your third book is, as you say, off time, or oh, let's, let's build up a, a bit something, or let's find out what happened for five years between adventures, uh, or do you see that, or oh, does Arium is there for you all the way, including during the adventure? It's, uh, it is, it's, you can play Arium from end to end. Absolutely. Um, we have, you know, the world creation, role playing, and then the downtime as mentioned, right? Um, and they all dovetail nicely together. But, um, and I mentioned this in a in a chat the other day because, you know, not everyone likes a more narrative style of role play, and our game is a little bit more narrative, but it's also a little bit more traditional than than uh, like a PBTA. It's not quite as it's not quite as we're building a story together as PBTA, for example, right? Um, so it'll feel familiar and comfortable, I think, for people who play Dungeons and Dragons or you know Western Games D6 or or something like that. Um, but it will, you know, but it also kind of stretches those boundaries a little bit and heads more in toward narrative zone than that. 
for example, combat is, you know, much, much more simplified than a Dungeons and Dragons game or or something um, that that uses, you know, or rune quests, you know, something where with hit locations and, and things like that. It's very, very simplified compared to that. And if you really enjoy strategic combat in your role playing game, then you'll definitely want to take your world that you create with create and use it with a game system that has a strategic combat system because we're not that's not the type of game that we're trying to create, right? But we think that, you know, those books, although they do dovetail nicely into each other, they can be used separately. So you can take those components of the game and and use them to build what you like and, and then use it in, with the system that you like. In fact, we, did, we had an early stretch goal um, that is called, it's building out a, a another sort of a short supplement called the Arium Bridge. Uh, and Bridge gives some, some pretty clear guidance on how to take your Arium and adapt it for 5e, Fate, and, um, and Tiny D6. So, so you can use it with Zoro then. Uh, no, it doesn't adapt it with Open D6. Ah, okay, it's different. Yeah, yeah. Open D6 is yeah. So, second edition of Western Games D6 is what I would like to have, but we didn't we didn't unlock a goal for that, and it would have required licensing because it's not oh, wow. open. Yeah. So we chose. Um, well, we did do a licensing agreement with Gallant Knight Games for Tiny D6. Um, but the rest of them, Fate and and Five E are open, obviously, right? So. Cool. Well, I believe we can trust the the community. I, I mean, uh, playing with the gauntlet and seeing all, all the places. That there's so many community resources. So hopefully, oh, yeah. the the game will pick up uh, enough fans of different systems so that uh, they they develop their own. So it's compatible with I don't know, Mask the New Generation. Uh, a percentile yeah. system, a BRP, uh, and so on. Uh, oh, exactly. Have you used? Have you tried it in? I mean, have you tried like quotation mark air quotes all the classics? Have you tried like a Lovecraftian setting? Have you tried a science fiction setting? Have you tried a medieval fantasy setting? Uh, have you tried a World of Darkness esque setting with with Arium yourself and found out how uh, oh, oh, it it went with each of those. Huh? Yeah, we've we've tried quite a few different types of settings and and it works I think pretty well um, for most of them. It's I think you know you can do whatever whatever you want uh, as far as possibility goes. Um, yeah, it. I mean, it will work. It will absolutely work. Um, but if you, if you, you know, there are, there are some rules that are made for those games that are, you know, very thematic, right? And and that is, I mean, to me as a game designer, I I very much enjoy rules that are tied to a theme, right? And so it's really strange to me that, you know, I. The first time I get an opportunity to make a game myself, we come out with something that's you know genreless, right? Which is is a little it it's it's kind of counterintuitive in a way, but but because the possibility of what you can create together is so broad and and it's so I mean we've never seen a group come up with something that they didn't love, which is odd when you <laughs> consider you know there've probably been. 30 or 40 games of this played at this point, right? Um, that that everybody loves the world that they create together. Um, and so it's just so powerful that we couldn't, you know, we couldn't rightfully say, well, we won't create gameplay rules to go with this, right? And so we did and they work well. And they do bring in an additional element, right? So we carry some of that world creativity component into the role playing um, with uh, the use of tokens. So players can, you know, create opportunities for their characters in game with those tokens. 
Uh, and so there's, yeah, that, that part of it does continue. And so I would say, if you want to continue on that path of sort of the creativity of what's, what's happening and what exists and, and all of those elements, then Discover's rules are perfect. If you want to, you know, if you want very tactical combat, they're not, right? That would probably be my, my prime example for it. What, what I, no, I would really like, actually, I'm, I'm not a big, big fan of, uh, again, shared storytelling games. Uh, it's not a criticism of their qualities. Mm -hmm. It's more a personal taste. But I really like the idea of, because my my issue with them is that they, they pull me out of my immersion and I like to forget myself into a character but mm -hmm. having something structured with you come up with a, something together through Arium then you play the adventures and then you are, you are in sort of first person and then you've got off time in which you you fluff out what is going on and what are the consequences of what you've been doing uh, in third mm -hmm. person and then you revert back for more adventure as the same character or another character in first person. I, I find it extremely, uh, extremely appealing. Yeah. yeah. So does that work in terms of genre? You, you, uh, do you have specific rules for specific genre or the game is, is fully universal? I mean, do you have toolkits which you bolt on? Okay, these are, this is the noir addendum that you bolt on the system if you want this type of vibes or, or this sort mm -hmm. of things? No, we veered away from that pretty heavily. Um, and so it doesn't, it doesn't include different toolkit rules for different types of, of scenarios. Instead, uh, we use a system of, so it's skillless, uh, a skillless system. So you have attributes, right? And you've got a set of uh, 10 attributes um, and those attributes should be able to cover pretty much anything that your character would be able to do. Uh, and then to, to give them flavor and additional ability, we have a set of, uh, or we have a set of rules for boons and banes where uh, characters have things that they are, you know, either very good at or very poor at, and they have, you know, mechanical um, uh, backing behind that. Right. Mm. And so it's, um, it's sort of, if I were to compare it to something, I would say that they're a little bit more like aspects and fate than they are, um, some other types of, of boons and banes where the player is going to write what the thing is that their character is good at, right. Or bad at. Um, and we actually have our next stretch goal that we're really close to reaching now is, is a toolkit from Diogo Noguera, who is going to to write basically a, a tool to help people come up with the names for those things, right? Because that's one of the things that we found is, is most difficult about that part of the game about character creation. Sometimes folks have a, have a struggle trying to come up with an idea of what, what should we name this thing what my character is good at? I know they're good at it, right? Um, and and so so we have that coming but but those and then they're based on mechanical um, um, rules where we have a set um, grouping of four different ways that you can can uh, set that your character is very good at something in four ways that they can be very bad at something right and they you just have to choose uh, which one you like the best Cool. Well, uh, it's about time for me to wake up my son from his daily nap, uh, which is sort of the framework of Café Rollist. Uh, he was back at the nursery, but now, because we will travel abroad, we are uh, two weeks self-isolating, so it's just it's just uh, the backstory of, uh, of Café Rollist. Uh, is there anything else you, you wish to add? Where, uh, are there, will there still be opportunities to try Arium online? Uh, will there be late pledges even after the, the campaign is over? And when is the, the campaign over? So when, when those people need to really rush to, to pledge and unlock those goals? So the campaign ends on Friday. 
so that the 18th September 18th yeah uh, I believe uh, 5 p.m. Eastern in the in the United States so I think that's like what 10 o'clock in the UK so we started at 9 a.m. Uh, it's two yeah it, it will be in the evening or at night yeah so yeah it's it's coming up uh, very close I think um, it was more successful than you expected you were saying so that sounds was, pretty good it was more successful than we, yeah, yeah very good very good and we're really happy uh, I I think you know if folks want to back you can uh, if you if that's not your thing, if you you know want to see it when it's out and available, then we'll have uh, we'll release the PDF for Create fairly soon. And backers are going to get it the minute we get money from Kickstarter, um, and and we'll release that PDF on Drive Through RPG very very soon after that, maybe a week or two after that. Um, Discover has a little bit more revision work to be completed before we before we provide that to everybody. We're not. I don't think we're going to do late pledges because the the framework of our Kickstarter is um, pretty simple, right? We've got a digital pledge. We have a print pledge. Uh, we're going to print a few extras, and we'll have them available for sale uh, on the Adept Icarus website. And um, yeah, eventually, but that's a ways out still. Um, but the the PDF copies will all be available on Drive Through RPG. Do you hope to get uh, Arium on the shelves of shops and to be available in print for you know for for a long time, maybe uh, with a, a distributor worldwide or something like that? Uh, we did reserve ISBN numbers, and there is one on the cover in case of that eventuality. But I'm not entirely sure that a a set of you know, very small format books, right? They're about 50 pages each will be the right format for shelves. I, uh, it's possible that, you know, we've thought about this a little bit. What would we do um, if we were very successful and people continue to support and enjoy the game? I think we might look at coming back later with a with a book format at some point, but that's probably a couple of years down the road. <laughs> and then, yes, we would look to distribute it for sure. Well, we definitely wish you uh, that success. Uh, Will, thank you so much for, for joining me. I hope we'll have other opportunities to play together. Maybe Arya, maybe something else uh, on the gauntlet. Uh, where can people find you if you wish to be found, which I expect you to do? Yeah, uh, you, can, you can find me anywhere. You can find the words Adept Icarus together. That's, that's only ever me. So uh, we have adepticarus.com. I uh, have a Twitter account, Adepticarus, a Facebook page, Adepticarus. Those are, that's the best way. Yeah. Great. Uh, well, uh, yeah, uh, as far as for me, uh, I recorded a panel which should be released on September 23rd for Albacan with a lot of really awesome people. I will be running Paris Gondo, the life-saving magic of inventoring. Also, I will run two sessions at Albacan. So if you want to try this, please do so. And uh, I'll probably submit more sessions of it uh, on the gauntlet. So people are really encouraged to, to check it out. To join in one of those. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, I'd love... Uh, my my world creation system at the beginning is way simpler <laughs> than I am. It's a 3D8 rolled on the table and it's optional. Uh, but uh, yeah, I'd love to to have you. Uh, thanks everyone who joined in the in the live stream. There were a few of them. They were a bit silent in the chat room, but uh, that's fine. Uh, yep. Yeah, see you around. Bye.